Good morning, come on, let's stand to your feet. Part the Herald Angels sing, let's sing together, come on. Part the Herald Angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy, my own God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise. Triumph of the skies with angelic hosts proclaim Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king. Amen. Christ by my 
praise the everlasting Lord. Late in time, behold him come, offspring of the virgin's womb. Veiled in flesh, the God had seen. Good morning. Wow, let me try it again. Good morning. I hear my voice echoing. Wow, that's kind of cool. I knew the room was a little bit cavernous, but hey, my name is Brian Stevenson, and I'm one of the congregational elders here at Provision Church, and I just want to say welcome to you this morning. We are so glad that you chose to worship with us, whether it's here in person or online. You, uh, you could be doing other things right now, but you chose to worship Jesus Christ together, and that's so important, and just as we sang, we're in this Christmas season, and this is what it's all about. You know, when you're not thinking about your Amazon shipments, you know, we're, we're, we should be thinking more about what this season is really about, and that's a great time to, uh, to focus on that right now, and maybe start focusing on that for this season. Well, if you are a guest for the first time, we would love to connect with you, um, either on the table out there, or those of you watching online, you'll see some information on your screen that you can connect with us right now from where you're at, wherever it is. So we would invite you to do that. And then one last thing is today we're taking communion. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ and you've made that decision to follow Christ, then no matter what your church home is, if you're here with us today, we invite you to take communion with us. And if you didn't see one of these little packets with the wafer on top and the juice, we have those on the table in the back. So during the next song, if you didn't get a chance to grab one of those, Go right ahead and grab one so you can participate in communion in just a little bit. We're going to keep on worshiping now. And again, thank you so much for being a part of Provision Church this morning. I mean, you know the Bible says that Jesus is the Lamb of God, the one that took on the sins of the world. And as we continue this morning, we're going to basically, as, as Brian was saying, we're preparing our hearts for communion. We're going to have in just a little bit. What a wonderful time to celebrate together. But I'm going to ask you, let's stand once again and let's sing this beautiful song, Behold the Lamb, that really shares the gospel of what Jesus did for us. Love. 
Father's heart displayed for us. Oh God, we thank you for the cross. Lifted up on Calvary's hill, we curse your name. We'll see your face bright as the sun. We'll bow before the King of Kings. Oh God, forever we will see. Can you see that picture? Behold the Lamb, the story of redemption written. On his hands, Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. Oh, we sing the Lamb, the story of redemption written on your hands. Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. We thank you that the victory is yours. You will reign forevermore. That's not to say that you're off the throne now. You are on the throne. You are Lord God, creator, ruler of all things. And Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your grace. And Lord, I pray today, God, draw us closer unto yourself as only you can do. Open our hearts to your word. Lord, as we remember what you've done for us in sending your son, Jesus, Lord, help us. Lord, let us work in our hearts, God, that we may be more like you. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated.
My name is Ryan Smith. I'm the pastor of college students and mobilization here at Provision. And again, welcome um, to those of you who are here. And I'll repeat what Brian said if some, some of you may have come in after he said this, but we are going to be participating in communion uh, this morning. So if you've come in late, there are little COVID friendly um, packets right back here on this table. So feel free to jump up and grab one of those at any time. So today we celebrate communion. We do this every month. And I think it's very important that we do it every month. But oftentimes, and w one thing that I'm going to try to highlight t today is the importance of it. We should be doing that every month. And what is communion? What are we doing today? What is this about? It's simply a celebration of the body of Christ where we remember what God has done for us through Christ. And it's uh, two ordinances that we're commanded to continue in. Um, that, that Christ commanded us to continue in. Uh, the, pre, the other one is baptism, which we um, participated in last week. So when we talk about the importance of communion, sometimes, as I mentioned, we do it so frequently, sometimes we lose the importance of it. We, we forget why we're doing it, and we just go through the motions. So I'm going to read a couple passages of Scripture to highlight the importance of it, and then we're going to talk about why we must remember it. So Acts 1, verse 8 and verse 9 this is the ascension of Christ. He says, he's talking to his apostles. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. So you go over just a chapter later, after he ascended, Pentecost happens, the Holy Spirit comes upon the, the church, the church is, local church is formed. And what does the local church do? What does the first church in Jerusalem do? Acts 2.42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers and to communion. So they devoted themselves. They gave strong remembrance to doing these things. So even in living so close to the time of Jesus' crucifixion, they never wanted to forget what he did on the cross. So how much more should we, be, should we remember? So why, why must we remember, number one, because we forget. This is assumed. We are professional forgetters. We doubt, we fear, we worry. And when we know what Christ has done for us, but we continue to fall, we continue to struggle, we must constantly focus, we must constantly remember. Second, Mark preached on this a few weeks ago, remembering produces unity. Listen to what 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four. 24 through 26 says, and when he, Jesus, had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, this is the new covenant of, in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So when we remember we proclaim the Lord's death. Well, what does that mean? Ultimately, we declare his grace and mercy. We declare what he's done for us as, a body, as the body of Christ. Consider Psalm 103, 1 through 5, a passage of scripture I love. It says, bless the Lord, all my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, all my soul, and forget not. So he's saying remember. Forget not all of his benefits. What are his benefits? He says, who forgives your iniquity, who heals your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. So remembering produces strength. Remembering satisfies us. So let's go back to 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. When we What it's saying is when we partake together and when we remember together as the body of Christ, we're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. We're declaring together in unison his grace and his mercy. So in summary of all that, when we remember individually, we're satisfied. And when we're satisfied, we're strong. And when we're strong individually, we're strong collectively. And when we're strong collectively, we proclaim. And that's unity. So what do we remember? Well, very simply, we remember what God has done for us. Well, what has he done for us? 
think one of the best passages of Scripture that explains it so clearly and so graphically is Isaiah 53, 3 through 6. Listen to what the text says. It's talking and prophesying of Jesus. He, Jesus, was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one man, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. We did not honor him, is what that's saying. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep, every one of us in here, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned, every one of us, to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's what we remember. This is substitutionary atonement. He was our substitute. He took our place. It should have been us on the cross because of what we have done, yet he has done it for us. He took our place. And we remember that. So what we're going to take the, this wafer and this juice, and guys, it, it's not going to do anything miraculous to you, but they're simply symbols that will help us remember what he's done. So lastly, while we remember, we also examine. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven through 29 says, Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone, for anyone, believer or unbeliever, who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment upon himself. So two things. If you do not have a personal relationship with the Lord, for your protection, we're going to ask you not to partake. Again, this is for your protection. It's not to make you feel uncomfortable. If you do have a relationship with the Lord, examine yourself. Do not take in an unworthy manner. Repent from your sins. And we're going to give you a, a moment of silence here in just a second to dwell on who he is and what he has done for you. And what I would, I would suggest, I would consider having a passage like Psalm 103 open and thinking over it, or Isaiah 53, 3 through 6. Have it open in front of you. Pull it up on your phone if, that, if that's what you want to do. I know it was, I think it was Charles Spurgeon that said, prayer is simply taking the promises of God and reminding him of them. So this is what you say about me, and this is who you are. So please forgive me. I repent from whatever it is that I've done. So consider that. So right now I'm going to give you a moment of silence just to sit and think and reflect and maybe read through a couple passages of Scripture, and then I'm going to pray, um, and then we'll partake together.
Father, we come to you knowing that we are but dust. And we thank you for all you have done for us, Lord. We're reminded of Isaiah 53. You have borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, Lord. We did not honor you. Lord, you're pierced for our transgressions. You're crushed for our iniquities. Upon you was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with your wounds, because of the cross, we are healed. And it's a season that we, this Christmas season, where we give special focus to that. You came to this world as a baby, ultimately to die for us and raise from the dead and unite us with you. And Lord, we continue, continue to be like sheep and go astray. We continue to do it. But then we remind ourselves of the cross. And we remind ourselves that you were the sheep that went astray on our behalf. And we praise you for that. And we give special focus to and special attention. So work on our hearts and minds today, God. We're reminded again of Psalm 103. I think of verse 10 that says, He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. You don't deal with us as though we've sinned because you've dealt with Jesus for us. You've punished Jesus on our behalf. So now the discipline and the consequences we have are for our good, your word tells us. And we thank you for that. Lord, convict our hearts and minds today as we partake in these elements. It's for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So take your cup and open this little top flap here and grab that little wafer or whatever you want to call it out. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four 24 again, and we'll take it together. So verse 24 says, And we, when he had given thanks... He broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's glorify the Lord by taking the elements together. So let's open the second flap now. A little juice. I'm going to read verse 25. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So let's glorify the Lord by taking the cup together. Amen. So I'm going to pray for us, and uh, Mark's going to come up and teach today. Father, we love you. Again, we praise your name. We can never... We don't have the words to even say, uh, but as I say often, I'm thankful that the Holy Spirit groans for us, Lord, as Roman eight, Romans 8 tells us, God. We thank you that you are greater than our hearts, Lord, even when our heart condemns us, your word tells us that you're greater than our heart, and so we thank you for that. We praise you, God. We give you this morning, Lord, I pray that your hand would be upon Mark, and you would use him as an instrument and a vessel for your honor and glory, and you would speak through him in powerful ways today. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, I'm always grateful to be able to celebrate what Christ has done for us through communion together. Uh, I, I enjoy that time. I look forward to it. And uh, something else I look forward to is studying the Word together, that we get to be together as we open up God's Word and, and see what truth God has for us. 
And I, I was thinking about it while I was sitting there a few weeks ago. I um, I sat down next to a couple people before the service started. Just said, hey, good morning. And it was a couple uh, young ladies, and, and they said, we're so excited for uh, the text today. We're so excited for the text you're going to be preaching to today. And honestly, that as like a, hey, good morning, we're excited for the text, caught me off guard, caught me off guard in a way that like, I think I probably didn't seem excited about the, te- <laughs> about the text. It was like, oh, really? Uh, that's good. And, and I, I thought, I, I loved that uh, earnest excitement for Scripture. And I was thinking, that's, that's the right way to approach our time together, is that we're excited about being together, and we're excited about what God's Word is when we're together. And just more and more, I, I hope that our culture is that it's not that I come to provision because Mark preaches, but I come to provision because God has called me to be a part of the body and because we love the word. And in loving the word, we love proclaiming the word and we love proclaiming the gospel. And this morning, I am excited to study this text with you guys. I am excited to be in 1 Corinthians 15. And it's our last Sunday in 1 Corinthians. And we're cheating a little bit. We've cheated all the way through 1 Corinthians a little bit because we haven't actually looked at every verse. In your life groups, you've seen most of the verses that we haven't gone through on a Sunday morning. And today, I mean, this chapter is almost 60 verses long, and we're only looking at a handful of them. So in your life group this week, you'll you'll spend time in some of those other 50 or so verses, um, but we're actually not going to hit chapter 16. It's It's kind of the outro of the book, and so I'm just taking this moment to encourage you, take time and read through these chapters. Read through chapter 15, read through chapter 16, and and enjoy God's Word there. Enjoy what He has for us in chapters 15 and 16. Today, as we look into chapter 15, Paul is turning his attention to the topic of resurrection. So the last three Sundays, we've been in kind of the theme of spiritual gifts, which has been a part of an overall theme in the book of 1 Corinthians, which says, hey, stop letting the world dictate to you what's important in the church and focus on what God has made important in the church. And so that's unity for so much of 1 Corinthians. It's stop dividing over this issue. Stop being in sin, which causes disunity in this issue, and focus on loving and honoring God with your life. Now, as we're in chapter 15, the topic is resurrection, and the theme is the same. There were apparently teachers who were teaching that the resurrection wasn't real, that there is no resurrection of the dead, and Paul is making sure they understand this is important. This is a big issue, and don't divide over it. Get it right. Be unified in understanding that there is resurrection from the dead. Resurrection is a main thing. And it's, so, it's such a main thing that what we get from chapter 15 is that if God does not raise the dead, then every part of our life is meaningless. That's a, that's a really significant statement I'm making there. If God doesn't raise the dead, then every part of our life is meaningless. But if God does raise the dead, then every part of our life can be about something more wonderful, and more beautiful than we could ever imagine. That that we're we're seeing kind of the dull reflection uh, of what is to come in this life. That what is to come is even greater and even better. If God does raise the dead, then every part of our life has great meaning. Even the parts that feel insignificant. So let's look at verse 50. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 50. This is what God's word says. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. That is a 
that is a wonderful passage. And I'm saying wonderful is in that it fills us with wonder to think about what we're being taught there. I tell you this mystery, we shall all be changed. We shall all be changed. Paul is addressing fellow believers here. I tell you this, brothers, I tell you this, brothers, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. I tell you this, brothers, your natural bodies aren't prepared for the imperishable kingdom of God. Our flesh and blood is our inheritance from Adam and Eve. He says that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. In fact, our flesh and blood is an inheritance from Adam and Eve. Along with Adam's skin and bones, we also inherit his consequence for sin. It's what comes to us. Genesis 3 tells us about that. In verse 19, specifically, this is what God is giving as a consequence to Adam for his sin. He says, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. In Psalm 103, where Ryan just mentioned, the author says, God knows your frame. He knows you are but dust. It's, it's one of the reasons he treats us with compassion and sympathy. It's one of the reasons that we have so much sympathy and compassion and kindness from him as he knows our frame. We are but dust. As Adam was of dust, so are we, and dust returns to dust. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. As Adam was of dust, so are we. But as Christ is of heaven, so will we be whom he has saved. 1 Corinthians 15 actually tells us this. Just before verse 50, where we started today, in verse 47, this is what, this is what 1 Corinthians says. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven, and the second man here being Christ. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have, been, have borne the image of man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Those under the curse of sin with perishable mortal bodies cannot inherit the imperishable and the immortal. Verse 53 says, this perishable, bo perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? If, if this is so, if this is so, if the perishable can't inherit the imperishable, if the mortal can't inherit the immortal, someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? This is verse 36 of 1 Corinthians 15. You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. Christians put on the immortal body by passing through death. Death was a punishment, but God makes wrong things right. And I love what God does here, even with death, even with this consequence. Now, this consequence God uses for us to have eternal life with him. Someday he will end death completely. Someday God will end death completely. But until then, he's given us freedom from the fear of death. Christians, death is no longer a punishment for the believer. For the Christian, death is a doorway into paradise. For us, it is the step into putting on the imperishable. 51, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Paul clarifies that some Christians will be living when Jesus returns. I mean, the early church was expectantly awaiting the return of Christ. And I think somewhat to our shame that we're this much closer to the return of Christ and I think that that anticipation of Christ is dreadfully missing from our churches in a way that keeps us from sharing the gospel and keeps us from joy. So encouragement church this morning, be excited that we are this much closer to the return of Jesus than the early church was. And they were so 
eager for it. Man, this is soon. And we shall not all fall asleep, but we shall all be changed when he comes. There will be some Christians who are living when Christ returns to raise the bodies of his people. Some will not be dead when he comes, but even they will pass through death. Even they will be changed, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. and We shall all be changed. I think we feel our bodies aching for this moment. A part of what sin did was make something God made perfect and made it perishable. And our perishing bodies is different than our mortal bodies. You think about mortality just means that there is an end to it. Perishing means that you decay over time. <laughs> and s- some of us get the idea of decay and we, we hate the decay in our body, right? I mean, think about the fact that our aches and our pains are calling out for this moment, this twinkling of an eye, this last trumpet sound. We should think of every bruise and every tremor, every pain and every sting, every spasm or throbbing or twinge as our body's way of crying out for this day when Christ returns. What a beautiful way to put perspective on our physical pain. But there's a day where that pain will be done. There's a day where Christ, when Christ will return and your perishing, perishable body will be made imperishable. And for some of you, that day can't come soon enough. And yet we continue serving, and we're going to get to why we continue serving, even through the pain. Paul, Paul gets there. God gets there. He knows our hearts. So we think of our pain, even in this way, as a, as a wanting of Christ's return. I, I think it's our body. It's the dust desiring heaven. Our mortal bodies are perishing day by day, but our perishing is different than the perishing of the world. Our pain is neither wasted nor final. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Our perishing is temporary. When Jesus returns and claims his people, we shall all be changed. We'll be changed from perishable to the imperishable, from the mortal to the immoral. And verse 54 continues. Look at verse 54. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus won the victory, church Jesus won the victory. Why do we look forward to Christ's return? Because he's already won. Like we're not wondering whether he's going to win the game. There's no anxiety for us in his return. There's only joy and expectation in his return because we know he has the victory already. Jesus won the victory. Death has already lost and Jesus has already won. And as we wait for Christ's return, death is already a shell of itself. As we wait for Christ's return, we know that death is swallowed up in something completely greater than it is. I mean, this isn't a small animal nibbling away at another small animal. This is, this is death being swallowed up. I mean, think about the life of Christ is something so much greater that in one gulp swallows death. I mean, it is not a struggle. He has done it. Death's attempt at victory Just the attempt at victory is forgotten in the presence of the true victor. Death, where is your victory? We don't remember a time. We don't remember it because Christ has won so decisively. The true victor is coming. Death's sting is no longer felt by those who have passed through it to glory. Death, where is your sting? We don't fear the sting of death. 56, verse 56 is a helpful verse. It really illuminates reality. And I think that's the right way of us looking at Scripture, is that Scripture illuminates reality for us. 
in, in verse 56, we consider that sin brought about death. But sin is also what makes death terrible. The sting of death is sin. So if you think about Genesis 3, perfection, no death, sin came, sin brought death, but death without sin is not scary for us. Death without sin is just passing through to be with God. What makes sin, uh, death sting is sin, that in death there is a consequence. In death there is separation. So sin brought about death, but sin is also what makes death terrible. In sin, our death makes permanent a separation from God. See, this is right and just punishment from our, for our sin. Because sin is not just, hey, we did a bad thing, it's okay. Sin is we reject God. We tell him he is not the king and we do not want him. In our sin, we say, God, we want no part in your lordship. That's what our sin is. And so the right punishment for our sin is God to say, fine, have it. I will separate from you. You don't want me. You don't get me. That's, that's right punishment. That's what makes Jesus so beautiful for us is that he was the one we rejected. He is the one who punished us correctly. And yet he is the one who came for us to satisfy his punishment on himself. That what Jesus did was to take the punishment we deserve to say, to say we deserve separation from God and we deserve permanent death permanent separation. And Jesus said, I'll take your place. I'll take it for you because I love you. Because our God is a God of perfect love, who loves even his enemies, who loves even those who deserve justice. But sin is the sting of death. And sin's power, sin's power isn't death. Verse 56, illuminating reality, the power of sin is the law. Sin's power is in the law. The law was supposed to be a, a guardian for God's people. That, that's how it's described, as a guardian for the people of God. But even with a guardian, even to protect us, the law is meant to keep us holy. Hey, people of God, here's how you can honor your God who you claim to love. Here's the rules. Stay in these things so you can love your God well. And even with that guardian who's supposed to help us, we still sin. So what does the law do? The law stands in condemnation of us. The law creates guilt in us because we recognize even with that guardian telling us the right way, we still do wrong. I mean, our, it's a correct response that we would feel guilt and condemnation. In fact, there is legal condemnation that we deserve. We deserve the condemnation of sin, even knowing not to sin. And standing condemned, we were separated from God. It's in the condemnation of the law that we are separated from God. That is the power of sin, is the law. But Christ has freed us from the power of sin. Romans 8. <laughs> Romans 8 says, There is is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Are you, are you hearing God's word this morning? Are you excited over this? Are you excited what God has done for you in this? Because this is beautiful. There is no condemnation now for those who are in Christ Jesus. Where the law stood in condemnation over you, where sin was powerful over you, now there is no condemnation. Sin has no power for those who are in Christ Jesus for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Man, man, I, I pray you are worshiping right now in the text the way that I am, because this, is, this should stir us to love and adore Christ, that what we deserved, he has taken from us and replaced it with freedom. Where there was condemnation, now there is no condemnation. Jesus has set us free from the sting and the power of sin. And like I said, we deserve that. He took our place and he has made it so simple for us to be saved. He has said, it doesn't take work on your part to be saved. I have done the work. It was the work on the cross that provides salvation. He says, repent and believe. Believe in the Lord God. So our role is just to have faith. It's by faith alone that we are saved, not by our works so that we can't boast. 
And so my question is for you this morning, have you, by faith, trusted God for your salvation? Not by your works, but by his work. Have you been set free from this condemnation and from sin? It's what he wants for you. It's what I want for you. It's what Provision Church wants for you, that you would be set free. God has gone to great lengths to do that for you. He wants that for you. So we read Paul's words in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 56 and 57. With that in mind, we read, The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. And we read that past tense because for us as believers, we thank God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have, we have the victory in Jesus. That changes the way we approach our days. It changes the way we approach our problems and our successes, our failures and our successes, because we have the victory. <laughs> and guess what? Your victory is not the raise at your job. The victory is not uh, a perfect relationship with your spouse. The victory is not uh, a perfect grade in your class. The victory is in Christ forever. <laughs> Our victory in Christ creates perspective for every other aspect of life. How does it change our temporary circumstances to know that we already have eternal victory? It helps us choose peace over anxiety. It helps us choose comfort over stress. It helps us feel joy over anger. God wants you to view this life in light of the resurrection. He wants you to view the life you're living now in light of the resurrection. Can we do that? Can we do that? Is that possible for us? It is possible. And the question is not can you, it is will you do that? Will you live this life in light of the resurrection? If we do, it's going to impact the way we live our lives now. This is not just some theological, theoretical concept. This is reality that we're illuminating. And when we see reality the way God desires for us, it creates changes in our behavior, in the way that we operate and live our lives. Look at verse 58. Therefore, so because of all of this, because of this truth, therefore, my beloved brothers... Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. In verse 58, we're, we're told to abound in the work of the Lord. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. What is the result of our knowledge and hope of the resurrection? What's God's intent for our knowledge and hope of the resurrection? It's to do the work of the Lord. That God has designed us for the work of the Lord. Being sure of our future doesn't make us lazy. It drives us from a place of joy. That we don't look back, we don't sit still and say, well, I'm not going to work hard at my job. I'm not going to pursue great relationships. I'm not going to serve others well because I've already won all the victories. So I can just sit back and be, be chill all the time. No, it's because the victory has been won, won we want to serve Jesus with passion in this life. We want to live with adventure in this life because God has made it for us to enjoy him in and glorify him in until he returns. It drives us from a place of joy. We have joy in the gospel to make disciples and serve others. That's what this truth leads us to. You can hear that in Paul's tone. It's, it's a tone, therefore, my beloved brothers, it's a tone of, you can do this. Hey, let's, let's do it. Pick it up and go. If you've, if you've ever been uh, on, a, on a sports team or lifting weights or doing something where you're pushing your body, there are moments where you have to say, let's do this. Come on, we can do this. And it's a, your body is broken down. It, you don't want to keep going. And here Paul is saying, hey, the resurrection could really make you say, what's the point of living? What, wouldn't I rather just be with, with God and, and let there be resurrection? And, and he's saying, don't let that seep into your mentality. Don't let the draining happen. Instead, with passion, keep going forward. You can do this. Give me some more reps. You can make it. Keep going. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, 
Paul's been giving this information, and now he wants the church to know what to do with that info. My beloved brothers, this is what to do with the resurrection in mind. It's act. It's do. It's be about the Father's business. It's being doers of the word and not just hearers of the word. Do always abound in the work of the Lord and do it with steadfastness. Do it and do not be moved. Do it knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And this is useful for us. This is, these are words written thousands of years ago and yet incredibly useful and relevant for us. You need this encouragement. You and I need this encouragement. Be steadfast, Christian. Be steadfast. Be immovable in doing the work of God because there are a lot of things in your life trying to move you off of your footing. There's a lot of things that would rather, the enemy would much rather you be living your life for other things and being, and being uh, complacent and not working for what God has called you to, the enemy wants to shake you from your foundation. And usually I think obedience to this call to steadfastness looks something like the story of the three little pigs and, and the big bad wolf, right? That, that you've got to do the work to build your house, whether it's with the sticks or the hay or the, or the uh, bricks, and then if you've built a good enough house, then there's a wolf that comes and tries to blow it down, but you've built the house, so the wolf can't do it. And, and maybe, maybe, I mean, I think our foundation is Christ. It wasn't our work, but, but maybe. More, though, I, I believe that in an honest take of what attacks our foundation, it's not big bad wolves from the outside. It's usually the enemy on the inside that's attacking the house from the inside out that we'd like to find the blame on forces and things and governments and people, that if it wasn't for this, everything would be all right. Where usually what we need to stand against and be steadfast and immovable in the work of God is usually because of the people we say love us. And it's usually because of the job that we work. Or it's usually because of our self-doubt or because of our anxiety or because of our fear or because of our disappointments. But whatever the source is, we're going to face things in our lives that try to keep us from what we're created for. And, and here's your reminder. Here's your reminder, straight from God's word. You were created in Christ Jesus for good works. You were created in Christ Jesus for good works. If you start to believe that the effort and energy required to follow Jesus isn't worth it, remember Labor in the Lord is not in vain. That's so helpful for us. That as God has created us to do good works for his glory, for his honor, that it is not in vain. And the resurrection assures us of this. The resurrection gives us confidence that our labor for working for Christ is not in vain. Galatians 6, 9 and 10 says this. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are the household of faith. In due season, in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So do good. Look, the resurrection is due season. <laughs> At some point it will come. There will be a reward. We will reap. So don't give up. It is not in vain. Do good works, not to earn your salvation. Do them because of your salvation. Jesus has already earned your salvation. So do what honors him. Live in the joy of following him and giving your life to the best thing. So what are these good works? And when we say, okay, we're made for good works. We see that in Ephesians. And we see that God has called us here in in the end of chapter 15, in, in verse 58, Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, always abounding in the work of the Lord. What is the work of the Lord? What, what, are, we, what are we talking about? Well, there's no shortage of that. Galatians 6 says that. Uh, as we have opportunity, God gives us opportunities all the time. Every moment of your life is opportunity for good work in the Lord. And I want to encourage you to see every moment of your life that way. 
the mundane moments are the hardest to see that way, but maybe the most important to see that way, that every part of your life is about the good work of loving Christ with your life. So there's no shortage of that. But I want to encourage you to consider this. If we're having to put some frame and focus on this, I want to encourage you to start at home. Where can I do good work? Where can I abound in the work of the Lord? Start in your home. So if you, if you are married, what does it look like to abound in the work of the Lord towards your spouse? I mean, isn't that a beautiful question that you might wake up in the morning and ask yourself? What do you think that would do for your marriage if you were living with that eternal perspective on your marriage? What if you're not married? What if you're the only one living in your house? <laughs> well, what does that mean? Well, God has given you your house for a purpose. He's given you your place for a reason. So what would it look like for you to invite others into your homes, as, to your home as an as a opportunity for discipleship and just to encourage and maybe missionally inviting people into your home? Or what if you have children? What does it look like to abound in good works towards your children? You're like, well, they have a house and they have food and they have electricity, so that's all the good works we need. But what does it really look like to abound in good works towards your children? What does it look like for us to disciple our children towards Christ with intentionality because we aim to abound in the good works because we are being steadfast and immovable as we follow Christ and look towards the end goal as we run this race So maybe it's serving your spouse or your parents well. Maybe it's serving your roommate well. Maybe it's inviting someone over and using your home to encourage and build up. There are so many good ways to do good works in your home and in your daily life. We don't don't need to put a cap on that. God wants every part of your life to be a part of the abounding in good works. But I do want to highlight this. I want to highlight what Jesus commissioned us with after his resurrection. That when he rose from the dead, when he set this off, the first fruits, this is what he commissioned us to do. He said, go and make disciples. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I have commanded you. If we're not doing this, we're not really abounding in good works. We have some good works that we probably are doing, but we can't deny the great commission that God gave us in, his, in, in that moment and then say, well, yeah, we're abounding in a lot of other things. Church, we must be preaching the gospel, making disciples of all nations. Preaching the gospel is our best good work. And it's undergirded by all other good works but we have to preach with our words that people are in sin and need saving, that Jesus did all that was needed for salvation with his perfect life, death, and resurrection, and that Jesus makes it possible for everyone to be saved by calling on his name. We have to be preaching that. And, and look, I recognize that in your situations, especially during COVID, you might not be interacting with a lot of people. So you're like, well, how can I abound in good works if, if I've only seen like one other person this week? I'm not putting a time schedule on this for you, but I I am putting a, this needs to be happening in your life, and we need to be strategic about this, and I say that with much conviction on myself, too. I, I, I was talking to somebody this week and was saying that one of the great things about leadership is that if the leadership is not doing it, the people who are following won't do it either, and so it's on us as pastors and elders in our church to set the example of sharing the gospel day to day. my hope is that we see people baptized every week because in our own spheres of influence, we're sharing the gospel and then we're saying, now here's the next step. That's, that's, That's abounding in good works is that we're preaching the gospel to our friends and our family and our neighbors. And if God never uses us in preaching the gospel to see people saved, then we've been faithful. But let's be faithful. Let's abound in good works. So do everything, every moment as a work unto Christ as you're following him with resurrection in mind, with the end in mind. And especially, let's be proclaiming the gospel as we do that, as a great good work. This is how we submit to this word of God in 1 Corinthians. This is how we submit. We repent and believe, and then we abound in the work of God. Let's do those two things. Let's, in our lives, be quick to repentance, and let's celebrate turning to God 
and let's abound in good work, abound in the work of God so that others might come to know him. Paul told the church in Ephesus that he wanted them to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that they may be filled with all the fullness of God. Church, that's my prayer for you. And I believe that as we abound in the work of God, that's how he enjoys filling us with all the fullness of himself. Let me pray for you and let's continue worshiping this morning in song. Father, we love you and we thank you for your good word and we thank you for this promise of resurrection. As we sing about your promises, God, this is one and we are so grateful for it that our life does have eternal purpose and eternal meaning. It, it, we do not disappear or cease to exist in dying, God, but that we are uh, existing forever, either with you or apart from you. And God, I pray that you would use Provision Church powerfully to see people saved, that we would not be separated from you for eternity, but because of the work of your son on the cross and his resurrection, that we might be with you for eternity. God, we praise you for your love. Thank you for loving us, even while we were still sinners, that you came for us. God, I pray that today as we continue singing, that we will sing with the, in light of the resurrection. God, as we leave today, that we will live in light of the resurrection. God, we love you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Man, I invite you. Let's stand together. Let's worship the song together. Touching every heart, I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. Die! 
Aren't you thankful for that this morning? Amen. 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 You may be seated for a moment. Well, what a day of worship we have had today. And boy, I, I don't know about you, but it's just so encouraging to be reminded of, of the hope that we have in Christ. And, and at the same time, it, it's such a, a, I hope it'll be just a, a conviction on all of us just to be the church. Just to be out there every single day telling people, we've got this awesome news. Why wouldn't we want to share it? One way people are sharing it right now on behalf of the Southern Baptist is called the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering. And if you're not from a 
Southern Baptist background, you, that name wouldn't mean anything to you, but Lottie Moon was a missionary to China for over 40 years. And so the International Mission Board, which is from the Southern Baptist, has a fund every year at this time. And they named it in honor of her because of her uh, just efforts for the gospel. But what that money does is pays for missionaries to be overseas right this moment. I read earlier about a guy over in Rome right now, Reed Carr. He's got two little kids and a wife, and they live in Rome. And when the pandemic hit in March, they were not allowed to have church, and they couldn't do a baptism, but they got creative. They got in a bathtub, and they streamed it to their church, the baptism that was supposed to happen. They were able to still do that because of things like the Lottie Moon Christmas Opera. And so right now, you have an opportunity. Uh, we have a space on our giving page, which is on our website, to give to that. And all of that money goes straight to support missionaries who are actively sharing the gospel as their career right now. And if you, give, you can either do that by dropping something in the back if you're here over the next couple of weeks, or, or again, we've got the tab on the online page, on the online giving page, and you can give to that. That's one thing. And then the other thing, you know, Mark talked about being a, you know, making a difference and, and how we can do those good works, and, and that should start at home. Well, you know, we, we have just a, uh, uh, it, it's so great, Gloria, that you've worked so hard with all your people to get us back into a, a place where we can have kids worship time, and they're doing that right now. Well, they've got a couple of resources. Just be on the lookout. If your kids are part of that, they've got a couple of resources. One of them I'm going to try to color this afternoon is, is a coloring page. And, and the other is actually information. You can just go back over what they've already learned and reinforce that. Start it right there at home for young parents. So there's a couple of opportunities uh, right there. And, and again, it just lines up so well with, with our, our charge to you every week to live, sent, and change the world. One at a time, we can literally change the world by sharing the gospel. I hope you'll do that this week, and I hope you'll be back with us next Sunday. We are so excited to be in this Christmas season. And, and just what it means that we had a Savior that came as a little bitty baby. Well, let's close in prayer. We'll be dismissed. And as I said, we'll live, sit, and change the world. Father, thank you so much for your blessings, for your son, for the forgiveness that we don't deserve. I just pray that, that for those who don't know what that is, that they'll ask questions and understand what that is and and for those of us who do know that we will be better about sharing that with others and not be ashamed but just be bold examples for you keep us safe until we return in your name we pray amen